explain some of what's going on here. Ben Hadad, of course, is the king of Syria, uh, long term enemies of Israel. And uh, so we understand that. And so he gets together with 32 other kings and their horses and their chariots and their armies and, and all. And they say, we're going to go up against Israel, who comparatively their, ar their army and their people are, are pretty small at this point compared to this vast army that's going up against them. And so King Ahab, which we understand from the Bible, kind of a wimpy king anyway. <laughs> He just seems to always be on the wimpy end of uh, the way he deals with things. And, uh, and he seems to be saying there in uh, verse 3 and 4, uh, let me see here. In verse 3 and 4, he, uh, he says, Thy silver and thy gold is mine. This has been Hadad talking. Thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. And the king of Israel, which is Ahab, answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. Right? So he's saying, or you know what? Basically, he's saying we surrender as long as, because here's what a lot of times the king would uh, kind of become a vassal king. Whenever they knew they were there was nothing else they could do, the enemy's going to prevail, they would say, you know what? At least he's going to treat me good and uh, I'll still have uh, some freedoms and all that. There's nothing else we can do. And so he's apparently submitted to that, and he's saying, "Okay, hey, whatever is whatever is mine is yours. Uh, you know, we'll we'll go and do that." And then, so here he goes, and he says, "Okay, well, not just that. He sends messengers that say, or, or servants that say, okay, beyond that, I'm going to take it another step further.' Verse five, he says, uh, he says, and the messenger came, uh, came again and said, "Thus speaketh Ben Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee." Uh, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children. And I was like, what? It's like, what else could you take from me at this point, right? But here's what he says. Yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall, shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in their eyes, they shall put in their hands and take it away. So right away, Ahab realizes, hey, this isn't going to be a situation where he's going to allow me to have a lot of freedom, and just we're just going to kind of be a, a, a vassal kingdom you know, to them. But actually, he's going to come in here and just take whatever he wants. So he goes to the elders of Israel and says, hey, don't you notice something's not right here? And they say, well, yeah, duh, you know, don't give him what he wants. We're going to have to uh, fight against him. And so basically the two kings exchange words, sending their messengers back and forth. And, uh, and, and, certain, and sure enough, the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, comes with his armies and uh, goes against Israel. But Israel prevails. All right. They uh, somehow, I mean, God allowed them to do it and they prevail and everybody gets away. Uh, some people get away, Ben Hadad, and some get away, but lots of people of the Syrians die. And so they go and they say, you know, well, their gods are the gods of the hills. All right. Which it's kind of interesting if you look at this, look at uh, verse 23. The servants of the king of Syria said unto him, their gods, lowercase g, are gods of the hills. They don't know who God is, so they're calling them gods because that's how they worship God. They just worship multitude of gods. But I like how in verse 28, God himself corrects them, basically, and he says, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is the God of the hills, but he is not God, the God of the valley. He corrects that, and it's not little Lowercase g is capital G because he's realize, because he's saying, hey, they said God's lowercase g because they didn't know who I am. I'm the capital G God, you know, one God, and that's all there is. Of course, that's a little, uh, uh, little extra thing that's added there. But so they say, well, we're going to go back against them, but we're not going to let them fight us on the hills. We're going to go in the plain with large groups of people. We'll definitely win. Uh, win at that time. So the prophets come to Ahab and say, this is going to take place again. Uh, after a period of time, they're going to come back and they're going to try again. So you better be prepared. Well, finally, they come back and it says in verse 27, their army is so big that 
the Israelites look like two little flocks of kids. Verse 27, and the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. So in a bird's eye view, if you were to look down at that field, field where they're fighting the war, you'd have like the entire field is just filled with the Syrian army. And if you were looking down at a field like that and you saw like two little flocks of kids, that's kind of how the Israel army was compared to this other vast army. Well, now look, if, if you follow a man of God throughout the Bible, you see that that's something obviously God in many cases has allowed a small number to prevail against a, a, a big number. But in this case, uh, here's what happens. God allows them to prevail again. And when it comes down to the, fa the, the, to the point where Ben-Hadad realizes, hey, we're beat again, he surrenders himself to Ahab. Like Ahab had at one time kind of was surrendering himself to Ben-Hadad. Now he's going to surrender himself to Ahab, to Ahab, but Ahab's people come and they're very diplomatic. Now, you remember I preached a message a while back on the art of diplomacy, right? I think diplomacy is a good thing, but it can sometimes be very, very bad. And I pointed that out in the sermon. Well, these guys are diplomats in the bad sense, okay? They're all filled with lies. They're playing a game. They're trying to get what they want out of these guys. And so let's read what they do right here. Verse 31, they say, And his servants said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the king of the house of Israel uh, the, the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads. Now, there's different ideas of what that means. What's the significance of putting ropes on your heads? I've heard some people say that it was actually a rope that was like around their neck, like symbolizing like, hey, we're at your power. You can hang us if you want to, because they would have still called that their head. But uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe it symbolized something to have ropes dangling over their head. <laughs> but anyway, it says, and, uh, and go out to the king of Israel, peradventure he will save thy life. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and they put ropes on their head. Uh, heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben Hadad saith, see now all of a sudden he's thy servant, right? Thy servant Ben Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he saith, uh, Is he yet alive? He's my brother, right? Ahaz being a little overly kind. <laughs> this guy that's trying to kill him, he's like, Ah, oh, he's my brother. And so, uh, and so now here's the interesting, here's what the, the diplomats do. Uh, verse 33, now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, thy brother Ben Hadad. They're like, yeah, yeah, he's your brother. Yeah, he's your servant. He's your brother. Whatever you want him to be, that's what he is. And here's what he says. He came forth to him and he caused him to come up into the chariot. And, uh, and Ben Hadad said unto him, the cities which my father took from thy father, I will restore. And thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. And so all is at this point well, Ahab thinks. All right. Oh, now he's on my side. Now he's going to do us well. Well, God never told him to do that. God said, hey, I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure that you're prosperous and you're going to wipe them out. He didn't have any intention for him to show mercy on Ben-Hadad like he did. But Ahab decided, you know, hey, I've won this battle. Now he's going to help build my cities and he's going to help do all these things. I can use him to get what I want. Now here I'm going to mention of three applications that we can take from this story. And most of it's going to come from the rest of the story that I haven't read yet, okay? But up until this point, here, the first point that I want to make is based on uh, everything we just read here. Number one, if you're going to let God win your battles, and, basic, and, and by the way, you ought to let God win your battles. When you try to take it in your own hand and make things happen and uh, you want to come out victorious, you don't let God be the avenger and God uh, uh, repay evil. You want to take it into your own hands. It's not going to end well. So you ought to let God fight your battles. But if you're going to let God fight your battles, you have to forget about your own plans and desires. Because here's the deal. We want to win our own battles. We want to get go out there and just get what we want. But we can't do it in our own power. So we're like, all right, God, just help me get, you know, success. Help me uh, to be delivered. Help me to get through all these things. And so God helps you. He gets you so far. And then you're like, all right, God, I've got it from here. 
All right. This is what a lot of people do. And I hope you're paying attention because you're going to do it sometime. You're going to be like, hey, everything's going great. God answered my prayers. And then you're going to say, I've got the wheel from here, Lord. And you're going to go about life trying to take it over. He's not done yet. All right. You got to let him fulfill his goal of what he said he's going to accomplish. You can't try to take it over uh, yourself. Don't just give it to God and then say, hey, I've got it from here. It has to be all his way. If he's really in charge, it's, you've, got, you've got to really give the situation over to him. And that's the only way to actually be uh, victorious. Don't stop serving God just because now you're all of a sudden comfortable. Okay. Now, this is what Ahab did. But honestly, I mean, the prophets are talking to Ahab and everyone's trying to help Ahab. But if you really know Ahab from the Bible and you read the context and you know the, this king, you never really expected him to trust God anyway. You know, Ahab is a very selfish guy. He wants certain things. I mean, look at the next chapter. The next chapter, 21, is the story of, uh, of Naboth. And he's got a vineyard, and Ahab is going, and he's wanting that vineyard. And Naboth's like, I can't give you my vineyard. This has been passed down to me for generations. And Ahab goes to his, his parlor, and he pouts. And Jezebel has to go get the vineyard for him. <laughs> right? and so, uh, so this isn't somebody that we ever just was really trusting God. Uh, but I guess God's just showing mercy on the nation of Israel right there. So the first point is that if you're going to let God win your battles, you have to forget about your own plans and your own desires. Okay, so now let's go to the rest of the story. There, here is uh, the crux of the message, all right? And the title of the message is, Smite me, I pray thee. Smite me, I pray thee. Now that sounds like a funny uh, thing to ask somebody to do. Um, the point that I want to make here, okay, remember these are prophets. This was a time in the Bible where prophets did some interesting things. And they were all pictures. There were things that they would do that left a, uh, an example, left a, a message. It depicted something, you know, it was prophetic. And uh, they did some interesting things. But here is... Uh, where we look at verse 35. Verse 35. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Then said he unto him, because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. All right. That's as far, we'll, as, far as we'll go right now. So uh, you understand what's going on. I, I think I've shared this, probably several people in here have never heard this story. So I love every chance I get to share this, uh, this story. But uh, one time Braden was a little bitty kid, a little bitty, I don't remember how old, really young, three years old, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe older than that, but he was pretty young. Sitting on his mom's lap. And Valerie says, Oh, Braden, give mommy a smackaroo. <laughs> and he's like, No, mommy. She said, Braden, give mommy a smackaroo. Now, I don't even know if you know what a smackaroo means. What she meant was give him a kiss. That's a word that you use, a smackaroo. And he's like, No, mommy, I can't give you a smackaroo. And she's like, Braden, don't disobey your mom. You shouldn't get in trouble over this. That's not that big of a deal. Give your mom a smackaroo. So he goes and smacks her in the mouth and her jaw drops. And she's like, what did you do that for? You asked me to give you a smackaroo. <laughs> but, but when she asked him that, he thought, I can't smack my mom. That makes me think about that when I read this story. Because here's a prophet, or the son of the prophets, as we'll get to and he just goes to his neighbor, and I'll explain that in a minute, but he goes to his neighbor and he's like, I don't know if he knocks on the door, hey, smite me, I pray thee. And the guy's like, no, I'm not going to smite you. <laughs> that's, a, what, that's a weird request. And then they, he said, hey, because you didn't obey me, a lion's going to devour you. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel bad for this neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad predicament to be in, okay? Now, the second point that I want to make is this, and then I'm going to explain that, some details of that, of that uh, story there. But when God tells us to do something, as hard as it is, okay, when he tells us to do something, we got to not be worried about the outcome, all right? Now, this is the perspective of, this is me preaching to 
the, the neighbor, the perspective of the neighbor, okay? So God asks you to do something, you got to not worry about the outcome, right? If God tells you, hey, smite this man, <laughs> you got to do it. Now, the Bible doesn't tell you to go around smiting people, okay? <laughs> but uh, let me give you, the, I mean, this, this seems like, like I just feel bad for this guy, okay? Who, who wants to hit a man of God? You know, just come up to him and smite me. No, I'm not going to smite you. I mean, it would take some convincing. And I don't know if he asked him several times or, if he's, or exactly what he said. We don't know all the details. I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts on that. But then this guy, like, he's just like, no, I'm not going to smite you, man. You're a nice guy. <laughs> I feel real weird about that. And then he says, okay, since you didn't smite me, you're going to get devoured by a lion. This is, this is crazy. And then the lion comes. And I don't know if he's just out the next day working or whatever. A lion comes and devours him. And it just seems like it's unfair. It doesn't seem like something that should have happened. But here's why I think it's sort of justified, okay? Now, if you read back in that verse, look at 35 again. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's justified or not. God can do whatever he wants to do. But I'm saying that this is this it puts it in a little bit better perspective. And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord. Now, there's a couple of different things there that you have to acknowledge, okay? Number one, who are we talking about? The sons of the prophets, okay? Now, up until this point, in, if you're just reading through the Bible, you haven't quite heard that phrase, although you do see like there's the time where it's like, is Saul among the prophets? I mean, there's, there's a group of prophets that kind of hang out uh, in some kind of school or something. I don't know. There's, a, there's like a, 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 some prophets, but you hadn't actually heard the word sons of prophets. Now, later on, you'll get into second uh, Kings and uh, some different places where this, is, this word is used again. But if you think about it this way, remember Elisha followed Elijah around and he worked with him and he kind of like uh, poured the water on his hands and all that kind of stuff. So here's what I think it's talking about. The sons of the prophets were not full-blown prophets, you know what I mean? But they were kind of like apprentices. <laughs> they were kind of like working f alongside with the prophets. And so they still were men of God, but they were kind of like what we would call preacher boys. All right. And a lot of times when we talk about preacher boys, you got, you know, the pastor and, uh, and he's training up some, some preacher boys. All right. Well, these are still men of God. They're just like, you know, they're still, and in that day, yeah, I mean, now when we got preachers that get up here and preach and they take God's word from the Bible and they preach it, but they didn't have the Bible recorded at that time, just only in part. So the way that they received the word of God is God spoke to people. And so sometimes it's really strange, like, like that verse I was talking about where they said, is Saul also among the prophets? Because God was literally like putting things into his mouth and Saul was just like opening up his mouth and things were coming out. Kind of like Balaam, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 yeah, Balaam, you know, on the donkey and all that. And, and he's, he's asked if he will say, uh, if he'll curse Israel. And he's like, I can't say except for what God tells me to say. And he actually goes up because he loves filthy lucre and he wants to get the money. He actually goes up and tries to pronounce a curse upon Israel. And then something completely different comes out of his mouth because that's what prophecy was in those days. God would just speak to them through, through their mouth. And so when we're talking about the sons of the prophets, and he said to his neighbor, it's not like everybody's scattered out like we are in the cities now where we just go to our next door neighbor. We don't even know who they are. This was another son of the prophet who knew that was com what was coming out of his mouth was the word of God. Well, how do we know that? Well, look at 30, verse 35 again. It says, a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord. Now, I suspect that when somebody spoke the word of the Lord, everybody knew that he's speaking the word of the Lord. I don't know if he said, hey, God told you to smite, is, wants you to smite me in the, in, in the face. I don't know how that plays out. I'm just saying there's some uh, clue there that it wasn't just like this guy had no idea what he was doing was, you know, was something that God wanted him to do. But he felt like, that's not right. I'm not going to smite the man of God. All right. Obviously, the point that he's trying to make has to do with the sin of Ahab because Ahab was asked not to spare Ben-Hadad and 
whenever he had the opportunity, he let him go. And so God said, hey, just like, you know, that ha just like uh, this man who didn't smite the, pro the son of the prophet got devoured by a lion, the idea was that he was also going to be destroyed because he didn't obey. But the point that I want to make uh, from the perspective of that neighbor is that, hey, when God tells you to do something, you need not worry about the outcome of it. Now, that's easy to say, but we all do. It's like we know, for instance, to go soul winning. We know, hey, you should preach the gospel to somebody. But when we're getting ready to preach the gospel, we're just like, I just don't know. What if they get mad? You know, what if uh, they don't want to listen to me? Or whatever and we began to worry about the outcome because we're human right? and we have this flesh but if we're listening to the Lord and we don't quench the spirit you know we will do something even though we don't know what the outcome is going to be but when you're following the Lord you got to not worry about the outcome and you got to just say hey I'm following the Lord and even that if the outcome seems contrary to what I would like it to be you have to know that you're trusting God he's going to get you uh, to the right place. Okay. So that's what I think was going on, uh, with the neighbor and the son of the prophet. Remember this, your rewards are ultimately in heaven. Uh, they're not on earth. Okay. So, so don't worry about, Hey, well, this isn't working out for me. I mean, here's Ahab thinking, okay, uh, God got him this far. He's submitted to us, and so now let's just use him to help build our streets and to give us all these kinds of things. No, God didn't say to do that. You don't think God can take care of you and get you know uh, the things that He destroyed, build them back up or anything like that. He just had to. He was supposed to submit to God. If you ever in the mindset, if have that mindset that says, "I know the Lord said," "I know the Bible says this," but I'm going to do this. I'm going to tell you, it's not going to work out good for you. <laughs> you can do it. You can get away with it. You're not going to lose your salvation over it. Uh, you can't lose your salvation. But if you don't just say, God says this, and even though I don't understand it, and even though I don't think I'm going to like the outcome of it, I'm just going to do it. If you instead say, I know the Bible says that, but I don't understand it, so I'm not going to do it. It's probably not going to go so well for you. You need to follow the Lord. The third point is this. Now, this is from the perspective of the prophet. Okay, uh, look at verse 37. The son of the prophet, I should say. Then he found another man and said, smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him so that in smiting he wounded him. <laughs> I don't know why I always think that, I guess because I'm just picturing in my head what that means by wounded, but I always think in the story that the guy got his teeth now knocked out, but it doesn't actually say that. It just said it wounded him. Okay. I don't know what the wounding was, but I always picture like smite me. And the guy just hauls off and whack. And it may lose his teeth. He's got blood coming out. And he's like, Oh man. And then he just, <laughs> he just leaves. He says, and the man smote him that in smiting, he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way, and disguised himself with ashes on his face. I'll talk about that next part here in a second. What is, what's the point that I'm making here? Okay, if we tell people, especially preachers, especially people in the ministry, or people who are a godly example, maybe your father, you're leading your household or whatever, uh, if you tell people to, to do something for the Lord, we need to expect them to do it. <laughs> we didn't expect them to do it. Now, it doesn't say here that he didn't expect him to do it, but here's what I know. If, if, if I told somebody to do something and they didn't do it and a lion came and devoured them because they disobeyed me, I feel pretty good about myself. <laughs> like, man, I must be somebody. He disobeyed me. It's kind of like a Eli Elisha, you know, they'll like, go up thou bald head and then a bear comes out and like devours these boys. And it's kind of like, yeah, man, I got the power. I'm on God's side. <laughs> All right. But the opposite is pretty humbling when you come up to the guy and you say, hey, smite me. And you knock your teeth out and you go away like, oh, man, what? <laughs> well, you asked him to do it, right? <laughs> How does this apply? Okay. And let me tell you first, this is everybody can kind of relate to this one, I think. You ask somebody for their opinion and then they give it to you. Don't be mad. <laughs> Don't be mad. Hey, tell me, tell me the truth now. You know, am I 
I mean, you fill in the blank, okay? I don't want to put words up there. You fill in the blank. And then that person begins to say, well, you know what? I'm glad you asked that question. And they begin to tell you, and you're just like, I don't like that person anymore. They told me the truth, and uh, they told me something. Or you might not even think it as the truth. You're just like, they told me something I didn't want to hear. Look, you asked them for their opinion, right? <laughs> and so you ask somebody for your opinion, uh, you should be able to take it. But here's another another thing that, that I took from that Um this reminds me of something I grew up in preachers. And so this is, you know, from a preacher's perspective, something that preachers definitely need to take heed of. <clears throat> preachers, it's really easy to get behind the pulpit, be spiritual, read the Bible and say, hey, you know, you better be doing this and you better be doing that. And it would get real easy to be hypocritical because you're not doing that. And uh, one thing that always goes in my mind is I think about all the times where it was preached. You know, keep the main thing, the main thing. How many ever heard that in a message? Keep the main thing, the main thing. And what is the main thing? Soul winning. Go preach the gospel. Go win souls. Go tell people, you know, evangelism. That's what it's all about. And then that preacher never goes out soul winning, never goes out evangelizing, never does that. And it's just like, well, that sounds great. Now what do I do? And they're just like, well, you know, just preach the gospel whenever you can preach the gospel. And I've heard stories of people who got all fired up for the Lord. They heard some great preaching and they're like, all right, that's it. I'm going soul winning now. And they show up with the pastor and they're just kind of like, all right, when do we go soul winning? And he's like, well, you know, I don't really have time to go soul winning. <laughs> you know, but I'm telling you story after story. A lot of people that end up in this church have similar stories about that. Like I wanted to go soul winning. Nobody would take me soul winning. Nobody would show me how to go soul winning. Uh, they preach that soul winning is important, but they never do it. And, uh, and look, we got to be careful as preachers that when we get up and say, hey, you have got to do this, that we give people the opportunity to do that for one thing. And then we go out and we do it at, with them <laughs> when they won't be uh, hypocritical about it. Sometimes when you ask somebody to smite you <laughs> and then they smite you, uh, you've got to be happy that they that they smote you. Look at Psalm 141. This is literally what David says here in Psalm 141. Look at verse 5. This is David. He says, Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. And let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil, which shall not break my head. For yet my prayer also shall be in their calamity. So that kind of goes back to that first example. When you tell somebody, hey, just give it to me straight. Just tell me. I want to know. Be honest with me. And then they're honest with you. Don't get mad at them. <laughs> <laughs> learn from that. Be like David and say, you know what? I want the righteous to smite me. I want to be rebuked. I want to hear hard preaching. I want to be able to let it affect my life and change me so that I can be better and more productive for the Lord. We've got to be willing uh, to do that. He says, it will be an excellent oil. Uh, you know, it shall be a kindness. And this is something that we see a lot in the Bible. Now, let me read the rest of the story real quick. Start verse 38, back, uh, back to 1 Kings 20. I mean, yeah, 1 Kings 20. First Kings 20. Start at verse 38. So the prophet departed... And waited for the king by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out. Now I notice the king doesn't realize he's a prophet. He thinks he's just some stranger, some uh, peasant or whatever. The servant, uh, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. Thyself hath decided it. All right, so the guy's saying, Hey, I told 
uh, he's, he, this prophet's just making this story up, right? But he's saying, he's, he's, this is prophecy, but he's saying, you know, uh, you know, he's disguised as this, this, uh, peasant man, whatever. And he's like, you know, so somebody told me, Hey, watch this guy. Uh, you know, while I go off here and there, and when I come back, if you've lost this guy, then I'm going to take your life. And so he tells the king that, and the king's like, hey, well, by your own testimony then, I mean, the king doesn't care. And he's like, by your own testimony then, you lost the guy, and so you, your life should be taken. And so th at this point, the guy removes the ashes and probably lifts up his, his cloak or whatever, and he reveals that he's the prophet. And he says in verse uh, 41, he hasted and he took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. Now, this reminds me a lot of another story. In 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel, I can't remember which one it is, chapter 12, you don't have to go there, where... Naboth comes to, uh, I mean, Nathan comes to David and he tells a story about the guy who, uh, who had a sheep that was precious to him. Well, I think we ought to go there. Uh, no, we're not. We're not. <laughs> okay. It was very precious to him. And another guy comes and he takes him and he kills him. I don't remember all the details of the story off the top of my head. And, uh, and anyway, David gets mad. How could that guy do that? That guy needs to be put to death. And Nathan says, thou art the man, because he had killed Uriah. And so he's telling him the story. And he's like, hey, thou art the man. You're the one that's being pictured there. And that reminds me a lot of what this prophet says to Ahab. Only here's the difference. Ahab, look back at, verse, uh, at the last verse again. Verse 43. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased. And he came to Samaria and I picture him in his house with his arms folded and he's upset. And then he goes in and the next story we read is about Naboth and he wants the vineyard and he can't get the vineyard and he's pouting and all that kind of stuff. He didn't learn any lesson. And ultimately the prophecy ends up being fulfilled and he does die in war. Okay, but, uh, but let's compare that to what happens with David. Uh, we do have to go there. Let's just go there. 1 Samuel 12 verse 13. I can't remember if it's 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel. It's 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel 12. No, that's not it. <laughs> okay. What did I write down here? Was it 1 Samuel? 1 Samuel 12. I don't know. Let me see here. Thou art the man. Somebody look it up. Don't let me drown here. Second Samuel. Oh, I was in 13. Okay. Second Samuel 12. Thank you, brother. Chapter, uh, verse 7. Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised uh, the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will rise, uh, raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbors, uh, uh, unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And Ahab would have went away displeased and upset. But here's what David does. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know what he did? He said, smite me. 
I want to be smitten by the righteous man. You told me what I needed to hear. It hurt, but I, I needed it. And so he received uh, the smiting. So I hope the, uh, you got something out of this message tonight from this story. Smite me, I pray this sounds like a weird thing, but there's some applications that we can take from that. First of all, if you're going to let God win your battles, you have to forget about your own plans and your own desires and just let him win the battles, do, uh, uh, obey his will. Number two, when God tells us to do something, we need not worry about the outcome. We just need to do it. And third, if we tell people to do something for the Lord, we need to expect them to do it. And, uh, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths of it. Help us learn from these things. Keep them and hide them in our heart so that when the opportunity comes, we can apply it to ourselves and we can choose to follow you and receive smiting when we need a smiting. And it's your will. I pray that you bless now in Jesus' name. Amen.